Hi there, thanks for downloading the latest episode of the Fantasy Animation Podcast. You can find out more at fantasy-animation.org as well as via our social media channels on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at fananimresearch, F-A-N-A-N-I-M research. If you like what you see, then please do support the show by subscribing, liking and reviewing the show. A quick written review, five stars, would be really, really helpful. It helps make the visibility of the programme even more. It helps us reach more listeners and it helps justify what we're doing to our employers. Um, So please, please take a minute out of your life to help the show. It would really help us create more content for you. Otherwise, sit back, relax and enjoy the latest episode. Hi listeners, welcome to the latest episode of the Fantasy Animation Podcast with me, Chris Holliday. And me, Alex Sargent. So for this episode, we are back into the world of Disney feature animation, following up our early discussions of Emperor's New Groove and Treasure Planet that are part of this, um, I think, intriguing era of post-2000 Disney, with this brand new episode um, where we're looking at the studio's 2001 feature, Atlantis The Lost Empire, a science fiction adventure that draws inspiration from Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Um, The film raised questions for me, uh, at least about voice work, the integration of... um, Um, digital effects and and CGI, uh, character design, and also how the film departs from the studio's musical template. Um, Alex, was this one you'd encountered before? And of course, any fantasy to speak of? Yeah, I've encountered it before. Loads of fantasy. I think this is a really uh, another really interesting example of a Disney movie that's not talked about enough, but certainly watched yep. and enjoyed by many. Um, I know there are big fans of this out there, so I'm really excited to talk to our special guest about it. Yes, uh, for the fa- this one is for the fans, and my, I would include myself in that. Um, we are absolutely delighted to be joined by the film's co-director, Gary Truesdale, um, Helmer with Kirk Wise of Atlantis, uh, as well as uh, earlier Disney features, Beauty and the Beast and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the latter of which we've also done as an episode. Um, Gary was hired by Disney back in uh, the 80s and as an effects animator on The Black Cauldron, one of Alex's uh, favourites, before moving on to story for Oliver and Company and then storyboard artist for The Little Mermaid, before for taking up directorial duties on Beauty and the Beast, which uh, was, of course, nominated for an Academy Award for Best Picture. Um, Gary later moved to DreamWorks, directing the Madagascar Penguins in A Christmas Caper and Shrek the Hall short films, and his name also appears in the credits of a number of computer-animated films of the early 2000s. Uh, More recently, he's credited as creative consultant for the 2017 reimagining of Beauty and the Beast. Uh, But we are here to talk about uh, Atlantis The Lost Empire, uh, so we're going to jump straight in with our first first question we recorded this earlier on so we're going to get straight in with um, asking Gary his kind of experiences about working in this so-called Disney Renaissance period yeah yeah um, I mean early on cer- certainly with with Beauty and the Beast we were just trying to get the thing done we were just trying to you know make, make a movie that didn't embarrass us you know and, and that could stand shoulder to shoulder with with the you know, the, the, the stuff that the guys, you know, 30, 40, 50 years prior had done that were it, the Disney classics. Um, and we were just trying to get it done on time. We had a short schedule. Um, we had lost a year, um, you know, of, of, of production. So it, there was no thought of, of uh, oh, it's, it's we're, we're doing a golden age. We're do, you know, there, there was none of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and even even when we were doing uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, um, there were people that were going, "Oh, this is it, man! You're gonna you're gonna get an Oscar for this one for sure." And we were like, "Man, just let's just let's just get through it, you know? Let's let's, let's just <laughs> we've got scenes to get out, we've got we've got backgrounds to paint, um, and we've still got story problems. So let's just get through it. Yeah, this part is great, and this part is looking good, but we just you know we." Just mm-hmm. got to get our heads down and, and push forward. Um, there was a feeling we'll talk about that <laughs> because the studio had been doing well. Um, yeah, the, yeah. Starting pretty much with like Little Mermaid and Roger Rabbit, um, 
the, the things were kind of on an upward trajectory. And in our giddiest, possibly alcohol fueled moments, we were thinking, this is awesome. You know, this is, there's just no stopping us now. But, but, you know, when, when you got back down to work, you know, the day to day, it was like, yeah, it was still, it was still a job, you know, and, and people, you meet people, you know, like outside the industry and they, Oh, what do you do? I work for Disney animation. Oh my gosh, that must be the greatest job in the world. It's like, well, it's a job, you know, I mean, sometimes it's really great. And sometimes I want to step in front of a bus. So, um, yeah, I mean, so by the time we got to Atlantis, um, the good thing was that Kirk and Don and I had done a couple of movies that were, you know, reasonably successful and that the studio didn't think we were idiots as much anymore. Um, because that was always the thing, you know, you, you, you go in and they th automatically, they assume you're an idiot and you have to prove yourself every time. And by the end of it, you're, you know, you're king for a day. They take your dunce hat off and they put on a little crown and yay, you know, we, we did great. Um, but the weeks and months go by and, and a new project comes up and you're back, you're back on the idiot stool. So, um, that, that was, a, it was a little lessened by this time because we'd done two films that the studio was reasonably happy with. And so we, we had a little bit of, um, um, a little bit of trust from them, which was not an easy thing to get, you know, from, from the studio. So um, that's what we really took advantage. That's the one thing we really took advantage of to make Atlantis. Um, it was Don Hahn that came to us and said, cause we were doing other stuff. You know, we were, we were just like basically sitting back and coasting and oh, what do you want to do? And, you know, just doodling on other little projects and helping out with other little projects. But Don came and said, if you guys want to do another movie and keep the team together that, that we had and do something that you want to do rather than what the studio tells you to do, we have to sit down right now and figure out what it is right now yeah. being like within the next you know few weeks. But, um, but we need to figure this out. And so that's, and so when we, when we sat down and you know, the, the, the famous story, and it's true, by the way, that we went to a, a local Mexican restaurant and camped there for about, I don't know, six hours or so. It was just like plates of nachos and pitchers of margaritas and and, uh, and just like threw out ideas. It's like, well, what do you want to do? I, mean, I don't really want to do a musical again. That's my guilty secret is I don't really like musicals. My God, um, I just I just so, heard the internet explode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? I, mean, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't really care for musicals. I mean, there's a few that I like, but as a rule, I hmm. you know, they're not my thing. And Kirk Kirk is a little better at that, but they're not really his thing either. And it was kind of funny. Um the two of us, Kirk and myself, who are, you know, action sci-fi, you know, that that kind of thing. That's that's our background. As, as far as like what, what kind of movies we like to watch. And then um, certainly with Alan and Steven, Howard, Howard was a little more loose and, and broad in his, uh, in his, in his likes and exposure to, to movies. But Alan and Steven were very steeped in the Broadway musical style. And the communication between us was kind of funny sometimes because Stephen would say, "Oh, it's like Pippin. It's like Oklahoma. It's like you know." And and Kirk and I would like, "Oh, you mean like Terminator? You mean like Magnificent Seven? And and so that was it was two worlds that were kind of colliding, and it worked out. You know, I mean, we we were able to make it work, and and there was certainly there was some mutual respect. So we 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 managed, um, but. When we when we sat down at this Mexican restaurant, um, and we said, "Yeah, we'd really rather not do another musical." I, um, and the the um, the tagline we we kind of came up with um, to do an adventure uh, animation was, well, you know, at Disneyland they've got Fantasyland. That's what we've been doing this whole time. Uh -huh. That's what everybody's been doing this whole time. They've got Adventureland too, 
you know. So if we go to the to the castle, to Cinderella's castle, and instead of going straight on to Fantasyland, we hang a left and go to Adventureland, and that's what sold it with with the executives. They went, oh yeah, yeah I hear you're right. Um, and also using the you know the old Disney um, live action stuff from the fifties and sixties, you know, the right. Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea and Island at the Top of the World and, and those kind of things, which we were you know little kids then and like yeah. this is great you know giant squid and um so so that's that's the route that we wanted to take and the studio let us do it <laughs> go figure i've got lots of i mean yeah lots of things not least the collision between oklahoma and terminator which we could spend an hour talking <laughs> about um but actually it, it does kind of remind me that, that there are lots of things that define well, there are lots of things that, as Alex said, you know, many many scholars as we sit here and write in academic contexts talk about the, the, the Disney Renaissance, this relatively uniform period. And, and one of them is the Broadway musical, which you mentioned, that kind of template um, and the use of technology. And one of the things that's always struck me about the Disney Renaissance musicals in particular is how the musical numbers are like action sequences. So actually, the collision between Oklahoma and Terminator kind of makes sense. I can see it certainly... Works, yeah. Yeah, certainly in the Beauty and the Beast context, it's very Baroque treatment of, of, I suppose, virtual space. But I suppose one of the things that, that, that I guess we would talk about with the Disney Renaissance is this relatively uniform formulaic period when actually the, the, the first half of the Renaissance, if this is what we call it, is one thing. But I suppose Pocahontas and Hunchback of Notre Dame onwards are very different films. I would say Beauty and the Beast is obviously very different to the Hunchback of Notre Dame. And it seems it seems you're kind of moving towards what would ultimately become something like Atlantis. I think the films are very different. Um, all three of the films are very different, but the first half of the Renaissance has this kind of Broadway style. And, and, and of course, Hunchback does have that, but it's also doing something in terms of mature themes and kind of gothicism and um, some really kind of expressive digital camera work. And, and you know, so I, I just, I suppose that the... the let's say the the experimental nature of of something like Atlantis the the turning left towards adventure land rather than fantasy land i feel like those sorts of turns were already kind of being thought through with something like hunchback so that the renaissance isn't isn't perhaps as uniform as as we would we would think it's actually kind of quite yeah not experimental but quite um uh, heterogeneous in lots and lots of ways. We have gone from Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast right up to to something like Hunchback of Notre Dame, um, Tarzan, and then we arrive at Atlantis, which feels very different again. So was that kind of something... You said you didn't like musicals, so presumably this was a very conscious decision to go. We've done the ultimate musical in Beauty and the Beast at the beginning of this period, and then... Uh, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Hunchback and Notre Dame, as will come clear over the next 45 minutes. But um, obviously Atlantis feels like, I've heard you talk about leaving um, behind talking gargoyles and singing candlesticks for this for Atlantis. Is that is that fair? Like a, This was a conscious deviation from this supposed sort of uniformity of this. Of the this the formula, it's yeah. Important. I mean, we were yeah. very conscious that there was a formula. And right, by, the right. time, by the time Atlantis was, you know, in in the works, um, the, uh, the, the, the glow was, was beginning to fade a little bit, you know, this, this upward right. trajectory I, I spoke of earlier was starting to peak and, you know, plateau a little bit, um, kind of around Pocahontas, I think. Um, right, right. and, and so we were thinking, um, it, and it wasn't as, I, I mean, certainly the, the tone and, and the, and the serious nature between, something like Hunchback and Beauty, it was, it was pretty pronounced. But at its at its root, it was still the formula. You know, it's still, yeah, yeah. Here's, 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 here's her song about what she wants, and here's the villain song. You know, all, all the things you could you could trace from, from Lion King, from from Little Mermaid, you know, to all, all of these different things. There was a formula, and we thought, I'm thinking the people are getting kind of wise to us. You know, the people are kind of figuring this out and, yeah. and we do have a formula and you dress it up however you want, um, a fairy tale on this hand or, you know, French literature on this hand, there's still a formula that's linking it all together. And that, <clears throat> that was one of the, you know, one of the driving reasons for, for pushing for a non-musical, not just like, oh, we don't like musicals it, because we did, you know, I mean, um, they were very good to us. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's not like we hated yeah. musicals. It was just, it was just, okay, we're kind of 
tired of it. Kirk and I, like I said, it, w it wasn't really our thing, and we, against all odds, we did kind of well doing them. Um, but, mm. but we did feel that you know over the course of all of these different films that the people are getting a little worn out, you know, from this this same, the same you know, the. The, the the different kinds of songs they all had, like I said they all had their names the I want song the villain song the the mob song the you know the 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 battle song all these different things that that all kind of came together to make this formula and so we said let's try something different did the the the, the kind of the industry stuff going behind the scenes you know we got Pixar had arrived DreamWorks was sort of breathing down your necks a little bit did that shape any of this desire to kind of move or do anything different or was that uh was that not a driving force um DreamWorks I'm I'm kind of convinced um pushed Disney into the digital age you know out of the hand-drawn 2D and into into digital with yeah. Shrek um because DreamWorks did, I mean, they did the the Prince of Egypt and they did um, Spirit, um, the the Spirit, yeah, the, 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 the horse movie, you know, um, yeah, the Stallion of the Summer, yeah, 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 the horse movie, the yeah. horse movie, we'll just call it the horse movie, sure. Because yeah. we had Disney had a cow movie, DreamWorks had a horse movie, um, yes. So, um, but those were two D, those are traditional and we were you know kind of shoulder to shoulder with them and they did some good stuff on them but you know i think we did just as good or better on on the ones we were doing but when they came out with shrek it was not only you know funny and you know making fun of of the whole genre that we've been doing for years it was digital in a way that that made people really sit up ants was digital ants yeah, yeah ants um yeah was that was that was also digital but it was i think it was shrek that really got people to you know to, to like mm -hmm. it, it was it was irreverent and it was funny and it was um you know and it, and it looked good it had that that kind of photorealistic uh okay. lighting and shading and, and everything and and uh all of a sudden every every studio it, you know in town thought that that was that was the next big thing and and hand-drawn animation was old-fashioned and nobody wanted to see that anymore and you know and that, and that's kind of the way things went and, and atlantis is just sort of at the end of the wave of that right so this isn't you're not worrying yeah. about shrek when it's being made because this is pre-shrek but it's it's sort of what it's the same year is it the same year or it's a couple of years after Shrek? Yeah, just yeah, yeah. about I, shrek came out during production of Atlantis, because I remember people talking about it and like, oh my god, it's just the funniest thing ever. And Don and I finally went to see it because everybody was talking about it, and we're not as impressed as as a lot of people. Yeah. You know, they're oh, they're just really sticking it to Disney, and we thought we make more fun of ourselves than this. I mean, yeah, it's 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 pretty funny, and I think I laughed out loud maybe once, um, but but all in all, I was like. It's pretty good, but it's it's not that great. It's it's got to be the you know it's got to be the look and the yeah sure 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 the whole treatment. So what you're doing is you're not you're not moving into the digital with this move towards sci-fi. Then is what you're doing is going back to these references from the from 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 childhood, right? From from the Disney parks, from Two Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. This is the stuff you're drawing from. This is the thing you want to make. It's not. Also, also comic books, okay. you know, because, you know, as you know, Mike Mignola was, sure. was one of our, our, our um, designers, yeah. art directors. And that was something that Kirk and I were both really, you know, really loved. Dave Getz as well, um, you know, our, 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 um, our designer and art director, um, our production designer, I think he was. But, um, yeah, I mean, we, we liked the idea of making it kind of, kind of flat you know like like pressing a lot of the uh of the of the shading out of it and and getting you know those those flat gradated colors um like an old comic book i mean that was that was something that that kirk and i both liked about the old disney you know really old disney stuff it was like it was moving illustrations it was like book illustrations that that was kind of the magic it, it didn't look like little puppets or, you know, live action or, or whatever. It, it, there was kind of a magic to the, to the moving painting. 
and we liked the comic, you know, the, the kind of pulp comic book look as well. It's I, I always think with these so so in terms of this kind of interesting timeline we've had we've had Hunchback in nineteen um, ninety six and then presumably um, production of Atlantis starts kind of soon after and you are eating Mexican food and, and enjoying eating Mexican food as you as you battle with some of these um, battle with some of these ideas and then. I suppose around the the, the two thousands, there's a kind of group of films. So Titan A, E, I'd say Treasure Planet, I'd say this one, which are quite clearly doing something, kind of something quite different and embracing science fiction in a way that's that's sort of slightly different, perhaps from from other kinds of of, of films. Certainly within the preceding decade, combining cell and and digital. So formally trying to integrate this this thing that is CGI and and, and as you say, trying to respond to I guess industrial shifts as 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 disney as slowly but surely giving up the, the 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 pen and paper and moving more towards kind of digital stuff um i guess yeah i, I suppose i just had a kind of question about um did, did you feel then that atlantis was kind of your ch- like a real chance to n- not not rewrite the formula but but as alex was saying like pull in influences from your childhood the films that you were interested in the, the different kinds of reference points not not just as you said the broadway musical but mm. Um, kind of blockbusters, science fiction blockbusters, films that you were interested in as a child, um, kind of genres, I guess, that were popular with the birth of special effects like Terminator and stuff like this. Did you kind of feel that this was a, a, a film where you could, or had 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 that sort of space to be creative and pull in all these different influences from Mignola's flattened style to kind of popular science fiction films? Did it? Did you feel like you had a sense of kind of freedom um, or, or was there a sort of, was there any trace of a, of a formula that you thought on oh, that was kind of pulling you back? Because that's what right. Disney are always always about, you know, repetition right, right, right. and deviation and that sort of push pull between that those kinds of values. So I just was really interested in 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 whether yeah whether that you felt that push pull as part of the the kind of production and genesis. Oh of sure. Of um, I mean, and to to the first question, yeah, we, this is something we thought we can push Disney into a different direction. <clears throat> we can um, right. Um, you know, Walt Disney was always about innovation, and while we weren't doing any like huge technical innovations, there were some. You know, I mean, like you said, there's there's digital work in there um, that yes. that um, allowed us to do some some pretty fun stuff. But it was, you know, first and foremost, it was the story and, and the um, you know that that's that's what we really wanted to drive this, not the not the technology. Um, but we also, as you say, we we thought this this is our chance. This is this is where we can push Disney in a yeah. different direction. And damn, we almost made it too. But um, you know, it, it did kind of <laughs> fall back into. Um, so so there was yeah there there was a, a, a fair amount of pushback. Um, not as much mm-hmm. from, like Roy Disney and Michael Eisner. They were they were pretty tolerant, you know, and and. Um, they um they they let us they let us uh have have kind of a free hand it was you know you take a step down from there and it was like peter schneider and tom schumacher that were a little more worried about um it, this this doesn't seem like disney to me this mm. this should be uh you know you guys you guys should get kind of back into your lane you're you're, you're straying a little bit um but i mean we, we we got that from from the from the upper management as well but I mean, you know, everybody was was reasonably supportive. You know, if, if we could if we could back it up, if we could back up our ideas with reasons why we're doing this, um, they they were they were pretty accepting. Mm. Mm. We weren't just like flying off the handle and saying, "No, we want to do it just because." So be quiet, yeah. you know. Well, I suppose, but the kind of brand thing is really important, and I and Disney brands. So yeah, we're not going crazy here. We're, we're we're still this is still a Disney movie. We're not. We're not having any beheadings or full frontal nudity yet, and the, and the film is the poorer for it. But that's let's not do that. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I always think that that kind of that that the way that this sort of Disney form. So it's interesting you talk about the the, the, the formula in in kind of relatively concrete terms because I think Alex and I when we've when we've talked about the Disney formula that's sort of how imaginary is it how how concrete is it is it something that the academics have conjured up as, as a way to make sense of these films um, versus how creatives and, and, and filmmakers and animators actually think in these kinds of formulaic terms so it's really interesting to mm. to hear that you've got this kind of 
sheet of of the songs and the things and 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 out of that comes a really interesting you know you're working within within creative parameters taking the disney brand in new directions and i think yeah it's 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 interesting to hear from from the inside how the formula works in practice rather than something that's just this imagined um set of specs i I mean that's that's i guess you know when 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 people talk about are you, you doing broadway style you know broadway musical style and i'm I'm just speculating at this point, but that's probably where the formula comes from. You know, that's where we learned it. Um, You know, Kirk and I came into Beauty and the Beast with no idea of of how to do this. And we followed the lead of of Howard and Alan, who were fantastic at it. And, you know, and then because nothing succeeds like success, um, you know, the the, the film after that, you know, and the film after that, the film Mm -hmm. after that followed the same rough template you know with certainly with variation and tone and, and that kind of thing but but this this is this is how it's done you know this this is how we do it in broadway and this is how we're going to do it in animation and it damn it works you know so 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 you're you're, you're resolved you're all sitting around together i'm i'm picturing a burrito do correct me if i'm <laughs> wrong uh and you you're resolved to do something different what when do you come up with the the, the story that takes a few weeks yeah you've got a time frame but but how does the, the who comes up with what and 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 how and what who, and who puts his what to the studio to get them on you know we, at the at at the restaurant um we were talking about <laughs> because we you know, it didn't just come out. Hey, guys, let's go to the restaurant today. It was like, you know, let's have some ideas. We're 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 gonna we're gonna meet, you know, in a couple of days. Have some think about it a little bit, and then we'll talk about it. So that's that's kind of how that went. So at the you know at this meeting, um, you know, sitting around chips and salsa and, and margaritas, and sure. we were saying, um, you know, I I do kind of like the, these old you know Jules Verne kind of. Uh, uh, adventure things, uh, journey to the center of the earth and 20,000 leagues and, and things like that. So that's where that, I, I think the, the journey to the center of the earth, that's, that's what people kind of sat up and went, Ooh, that's interesting. And then we went and, you know, watched or read the, uh, you know, the, the, the book. I know I read the book and I thought, well, it's a great idea, but the book is really dull. You know, it's, 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 they don't even get to the center of the earth. Um, they, and a lot of it is just them fumbling around in the dark, you know, in like total darkness. And um, just when it starts to get good, they, they leave. So we said, okay, we won't do that story per se, but we'll, you know, we'll take that idea. They're going to a subterranean thing. What, what are they looking for? And it, it was probably Tab or maybe Kirk. It wasn't me. Um, and said, "What if? What if it's Atlantis? What if? What if they're? You know, they go down there and they find Atlantis. Oh, that's cool. What's there? You know." And then we had to hmm. kind of construct the story from that. It's like, yeah, there could there could still be people there. There could it could still be alive. And then why is it still alive? And you know, and just like building all the uh, all the logical points from that. How did they get down there? What happened? Um, are they, are they still alive? Are they like Morlocks or are they, are they, uh, you know, and it, we kind of came a, a, upon the idea that it was a civilization that had fallen, but they were, you know, there were still, it's like, if you look at some ancient civilizations that have fallen up here on the surface, you know, like Angkor Wat or Egypt, you know, that were like massive empires and mostly that's forgotten now. You know, then people are digging up clues about it. And but like Don said, you know, you hang in laundry from the pyramids now. It doesn't mean what it what it used to. Um, and, and that's that's kind of the direction we wanted to go with it. That it was once it was once great and powerful and grand and it's fallen and a lot of a lot of their own history is forgotten. There's, yeah, and, you know, it sounds like the, ex- the Go ahead. Yeah. It sounds like the excitement is is building this world, right? I, I I note that the thing starts with a quote from Plato, and I note that we've got this like Milo character who's constantly giving like the characters these these references of like different things that I'm assuming you all like you know you went away and thought, okay let's for inspiration let's take this reference and let's find these um 
let's find where it's talked about. But but actually, this you know the pleasure of it is let's create something new, yeah. right? Then was that was that is that what got you excited? That's let's think about the kingdom. Where would it be? How does it look? Um, who goes right. where? How does it strike? We knew we, knew we wanted um, we knew we wanted it to look a little different than the classical um, interpretation of it, which. Uh, I think Don kind of coined the term the the uh, the aquarium Atlantis, where it's you know it's like Greek columns and and uh, um, yeah, it's, that's whatever that's what everybody kind of pictures when when you say Atlantis. Um, sure. And that's another thing we found is like everybody's heard of it, everybody knows the word, the name Atlantis, but nobody knows the story mm. because there is no story. You know, it's like whatever you make of it. So so that gave us a. a, a huge uh element of freedom right there that on one hand i had great name recognition because hey it's atlanta <laughs> i've heard of that but then yeah. you know we were free to uh, to 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 make whatever story we wanted out of it i mean that's the good and the bad Obviously. because like on, on hunchback and beauty we were we were um you know, we were following a fairy tale or literature, and this one it was like it was a blank page, which is both exhilarating and terrifying. Well, I was, I was thinking about yeah, because obviously with with in Hunchback Notre Dame, you're dealing with with a, a particular kind of location, and here, I mean, the film doesn't spend too much time in Washington, 1914. Quite quite early on, we get right. we get down and, and kind of on the on the journey, uh, and a lot of a lot of the, the if I remember, the, a lot of the Washington scenes are sort of interiors as well. Right. Um, which is which is sort of you know it's it's a nice kind of counterpoint to, to the um, to the space uh, of Atlantis. Um, so because I was thinking about how how much of a challenge I'm really interested in kind of yeah as Alex was saying this, this sort of animated worlds and the challenge of building fictional coherent um, legible authentic animated worlds with rules and um, so the film must pose this incredible challenge to build this to build this space this sort of sunken sunken space. But I wanted to go back to the ca- kind of character design. So how early on? How early on in this process did you think that this sort of flattened comic book style with slightly angular f- characters that is obviously a little bit removed perhaps stylistically from uh, a, a, a different kind of a, a Disney hyperrealism? I just, I just wondered at what point, if you have this idea, do, do, do you think that this flattened kind of comic book style would be a really good fit for this kind of adventure story? Um, I, I think... I think the idea of a flattened, um, like non-shaded, non-photorealistic yeah. look came upon pretty early. Because I remember going right. to, um, we, we did go to Washington, D.C. We went to the Smithsonian and we, we were looking at um, um, devices and vehicles and, you know, th- things from, from that oh, yeah. era, from like World War One. We went to, I think it was called the Maryland Tank Museum. And it's this vast like field with cement pads and armored vehicles on them you know that, that this guy um uh this retired army captain who was you know putting together and we'd walk from from vehicle to vehicle and it's like okay this one here was made by czechoslovakia and this was an american one and this was a british one and you know so we had so many pictures and we'd climb around in them and wow look at the size of those rivets and bolts and you know just so yeah. So we, we were able to, to do that, but also at the Smithsonian, there was a painting I, I know we saw, and I can't remember who, who the artist was, but rather than, you know, the, the, the kind of, um, you know, the, the fading and the, and the, and the, um, the shading that, that's commonly used, it was like flat, flat areas of color, very close to each other, but layered on top of each other. Um, and, we looked at that and said, that's, that's the kind of thing, you know, that's it. You stood back and it was still gorgeous. It was still beautiful and it still had volume and shape and, and everything, but it had that flatness and it had that, that real graphic quality that we really loved. Um, and I think it was a little later than that, that, that we said, what if we got, what if we got Mike Mignola? What if we got, you know, this, you know, went to this kind of Hellboy, um, uh, you know, direction with our characters because we had had um, animators and designers already working on characters. We had, you know, like reams of, of uh, character designs that were done in the more traditional way. And when Mike came on board, you know, he took 
all of those, you know, and looked at them and, you know, stewed them around. And he came out with his own versions. And that's ultimately what we, what we said, okay. And they're not exactly Mike's designs because then they went back to, you know, to, into the Disney uh, mill and uh, yeah, right. Cause right. you know, the animators, yeah. anytime you do um, a design of a character, and the, the designer comes up with something. We go, Eureka! That's it. That's perfect. Let's do that. And you give it to an animator. They're gonna they're gonna change it because they say, well, mm -hmm. if you move it around, the neck isn't gonna work, or the elbow is not gonna, or you know, whatever whatever they need to make this character move and live, they, they have to do. And that sometimes involves changing the design a little bit. So that's that's kind of what that's kind of what happened with with mike's designs but we we went really close to his to his stuff which funny funny enough i mean he was he was as shocked as anyone that, that we went that way he said what, what are you guys doing yeah i like this yeah, idea yeah. of the disney mill the kind of going back into the system i remember um i kind of think it was hercules with the sort of half disney half gerard scarf right style the sort of right. the, the, the creative bargain that disney is you, you know have this disney formula that is that is narrative and, and let's say kind of ideological and political as much as it is visual and then you have these and this is why i find this late 90s early 2000s period really interesting these kind of many creative bargains that are being struck with with the disney formula and and the way in which the disney mill is, is embracing different kinds of influences and, and styles and things so i i think that the half scarf half disney stuff um and this and this goes back to, to Alec, well the earlier point around sort of the way that academics versus industry talk about it because there's an article about this period that that uh, one of our colleagues Chris Pallant, um has written he's written a book on Disney but he he talks about this as a kind of neo Disney period like a really interesting so we've got um, we've got uh, Emperor's New Groove and and Lilo and Stitch and Treasure Planet and Atlantis just films that are, are are kind of really striking and doing something that's really different and and he kind of talks about it in this as part of a, a formal heterogeneity and a sort of thematic heterogeneity that are marked as much from their disparities from the disney formula as they are from each other um interesting because here i was struck in, in atlantis by the luminescence of the film and and the and the and the, and the like the war genre and how influential the the kind of war film seems to be. I hadn't really thought about it, but this when I watched Atlantis again this afternoon, I was really struck by how this film comes out the same year. I think it's the same year as Pearl Harbor. And if I I did a bit of googling and found out that there was a specific trailer for Atlantis that was attached to the release of the Pearl Harbor film, and so that kind of got me thinking. There was a real emphasis, even at the level of marketing, to sort of suggest this is this is not Beauty and the Beast. It's from the same. It's from the same folks that did Beauty and the Beast or Hunchback, but it's, it's yeah, dealing with... So So my question was about war films. Um, to what extent, because this military... You talked about um, these sorts of army vehicles and stuff and the rivets. So was the war, was the war film, the war genre, was this something that was particularly... So I, I was struck by the some of the... the certainly the battle sequence, I think, um, the kind of famous battle sequence of the film. Stroke me, it struck me as very militaristic, so... Is, is war is the war genre is war cinema a, a reference point for how the kind of stylistic elements of, of that because I was definitely struck by it this time I watched it um, I don't think we were trying to make a war film but but because of the time period we chose um, mm -hmm. it was around the time of World War one um, and to us that time period was interesting why did sorry sorry guy why did you choose that time period before you because that's that, that was a good question i'm glad that you asked well there we go so i mean we found that time period interesting because well number one during wartime a lot of innovations are made you know you get a lot of technical advancements and and uh, scientific advancements because of wartime because of necessity but so. this was a time that we were really on kind of a crossroads technologically. World War I, 1914, 1910, around that time was a time when you would see um, horse-drawn carriages and horseless carriages. You know, this was electric lights were replacing gas lamps. Um, I mean, there's, there's a big technological leap where there was still a lot of the old, but there was, there was this new creeping in and the new wasn't really nailed down yet. It was all over the place. You know, you look at, you look at early automobile designs and 
there is like the sky was it was the wild west you know there was no there was no rules and that was one of the things that we really liked it's like there wasn't a formula for that kind of technology yet it was like whatever whatever worked and a lot of stuff didn't work you know but but this was this was what we thought was really interesting in this time period was there's you know you, you still have okay taking the war time you, you still had mounted cavalry but they were going up against armored you know these lumbering things that didn't quite work yet but you could see oh this this is going to be something you know in another 25 years this is this is going to be right. This is going to be a problem, but you know, at at that time, it was it, it it was a really interesting time in our minds that that mankind was like kind of on this verge, you know, they're like right on the doorstep of, of something new. Interesting, interesting, and that and that's why. So you almost took that as a as a as a way of doing the design of your own sort of right. technology. In the, the right, right. Yeah, we like said, yeah, the sky's the limit. Yeah. You know, I mean, Preston Whitmore is a, is a He's rich as the Sultan of Brunei, and you know he can afford to 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 experiment and dabble and and do all of this stuff. And yeah, some of it probably works great, and some of it is probably a complete flop. And you know there were designs of stuff, uh, vehicles and and devices and tools uh, that never made it into the film, but they were a lot of fun. You know the 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 mm. the, the bridge making machine and the you know just all all of these different all these different devices that uh, that that uh, we, we thought yeah it's plausible you could, they could they could probably come up with that in 1914 so the technology is both forward looking and backward looking in a way that you know there's exactly what you were both saying that a lot of the, the the devices and contraptions have a have a whiff of the old about them they have you know there's they they don't feel like they're they're space age uh, but there's also obviously technology in it that is space right. age and that's that's a really kind of that's the look that the film's kind of embraces both in its design of Atlantis and and the world itself and 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 yeah and, and the other thing you achieved i don't know if this was conscious or not was that by setting it in 1914 and you've got this kind of uh you know quasi anti imperialist narrative of 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 plundering whilst in the background, you've got kind of World War One just lurking over here, sort of my hands in the corner <laughs> of the screen. That is a little spectre for everyone. You don't you don't dwell on it, but there are occasional lines, right? There's that bit where Milo says, like, you're probably going to give it to the Kaiser, right. and like, the, you know, you you evoke right. it to kind of it helps it helps the themes of the movie. In many it ways. was it was a little he more heavy handed in early drafts of, of the script, okay. um, and we thought, eh, that's too much. you know, that's that's not what our story is. That's what the time period is, and and we don't want to lose it, but we didn't want to make it the story. So, so we, you know, we from from going from going on a you know like diving into it with with uh, <laughs> mixing my metaphors, diving in with both feet. Um, <laughs> Yeah. We, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we uh, while you wait. Um, yeah, but but uh, we 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 thought it's it's a, it's a little much, you know. We're, we're we're confusing things, so let's 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 keep our let's keep our story about you know about Atlantis, about our characters, and that yeah, that is a background, and it is it is a concern, but that's not the main concern. I the, the way that you were talking about the the 1914 setting, this kind of technological frontier. You said you got the old with the new creeping in, uh, that the new is not nailed down yet, uh, that there wasn't a formula for this kind of technology, and that this is going to be something <laughs> in 25 years. This feels this feels like you could be talking about computer-generated imagery versus cell animation. This sort of, we don't really know what, you know, CGI is not that old. You know, the film um, Atlantis is, what, six years after Toy Story, but 10 years after the second Terminator and 20 after Tron. So, you know, the CGI isn't really that sort of, that sort of new yet and maybe maybe cell animation cell animated films are actually really rich spaces to think about what this technology would look like because there's a real sense of integration um because you are trying to balance these two kind of image making forms i just i just wondered did you have any did you decide which sequences would be cgi you talked about kind of characters that the design of characters had to move in specific ways and i just wondered if you had similar conversations mm -hmm. around around kind of cgi this sequence would be good in this technology and then you had maybe pushback oh no it's that's not going to work and but i just kind of wondered in this period where cgi is being integrated with technology at a time when the new is as you said creeping yeah. in 
did you decide or did you kind of think this would be really good in CGI and I think um, and we can do it in CGI was there was that sort of a little out of your hands how does that sort of work that integration of the digital we um we thought probably the best use of it would be for the, like for the vehicles you know the things that would be a right. nightmare to draw by hand um, because <laughs> they're complex and the, the the geometry and the perspective and, and all of that I'm mean, sure you could do it but th there would have been a lot less because you know the you know it, it would take a long time and and a lot of pencil mileage and time equals money and you know mm -hmm. having people draw that by hand we, we just by necessity there wouldn't be as much and we thought we could get more more bang for our buck if if we did those yeah. digitally um the same with you know not not just the uh the explorers vehicles but the the atlantean vehicles as well the flying stone fish the the stone giants that, those kind of um and then the other things were, were um those were more story driven it wasn't it wasn't like and, and this was something we got from all the way back on beauty and the beast when, when we did the ballroom um that was not in the script it wasn't like and then we'll do this great you know we'll, we'll do this 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 digital thing where we move around. Um, that was Roger Allison and, and Brenda Chapman who, who storyboarded it. And we went in to see the, the storyboards and they said, we think this would be really cool if we could move the camera around, we could sweep it around, you know, follow them in their dance and would heighten the emotion. It would heighten the, you know, just everything. And we said, yeah, that's a great idea. You know, it's having the capability to do something. We saw this another films from other studios that I won't name, but, but having the capability to do it doesn't mean you should do it, you know? And, and, yeah. and we thought it's, we would do this where it, where it worked the best for the story, not just because it looked cool, but you know, when, when Milo and Tita climb up onto the top of that, that giant for the first time and, and the, the camera swoops around, that was, you know, that was the reason. It's you want it to be yeah. a breathtaking vista for Milo. You know, this is supposed to take his breath away, and it's supposed to take ours as well. So those those are the reasons why. And you know, when when Milo's on the um, the the little the little um, containment pod with with Kita inside, and they're going through the lava tunnel, um, supposed to be super exciting. Supposed to be just like hair raising. And that would have been really hard to do, possible, but really hard to do in a traditional manner. So let's make a let's make a digital tunnel, and then you know, hand drawn lava going after it. But um, yeah, it was it was story driven. the 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 vehicles was was practicality. You know, that was and and certainly you know some of the buildings that we like turned around for for practical reasons. But but um, the like I said, like like the ballroom in Beauty and the Beast, um, it was that that was for an emotional or for for a story reason. Did you aim this at a slightly more mature demographic at yeah. all? Did you think about audiences at all? I mean, it, it feels like it's a movie aimed not necessarily for a completely different, but but maybe a, a, a you know whoever whoever Disney whoever Beauty and the Beast is aimed at plus three or four years, something like that. Cause there just seems to be, you know, with references to history, with reference to all this stuff, or was that just not in your, in yeah, your I mean, we were, we were aware of it, but one of the things that, that we had found, uh, you know, over the years is that kids are a lot smarter than, than people give them credit for, particularly studio executives, you know, the, the, um, the, you don't need to talk down to kids. And if they don't get something right away, there's still something there for them to enjoy. Or God forbid they look it up or ask questions. You know, it's like, why, sure. why did this happen? You know, it's like, and and if, as long as the answer is not like saucy or controversial or anything like that, mm. yeah, we're we're fine. I mean, and and this is something that we went back when people would say, "Isn't this a little too adult? Did you think kids are going to understand this?" It's like, man, have you ever heard of Bugs Bunny? You know, look at look at the the old Warner Brothers cartoons. And tell me you understood that when you were six years old, but you still enjoyed it. And now you enjoy it on a different level. And that's weirdly, that's what we're finding out about Atlantis now is um, it didn't really perform that great, you know, at, at the box office when it came out. Um, parents were a little put off by it because there was a lot of, 
a lot of gunfire and there weren't songs and you know it was not the formula and what people didn't take into account was their kids were watching this you know six seven eight year olds were watching it and they didn't have a voice then but they're like you know 30 years old now and we're yeah. getting a lot of i mean you know on social media we're saying I, I saw this as a kid and we loved it you know and it was one of my favorite movies and so that's that's super gratifying <laughs> that, that hey we you know it did work after all Absolutely. And, and yeah, I, I hear that anecdotally all the time when I've talked to people that were doing this episode, they were, you know, that they're, they're absolutely like that's that's absolutely true. And I think there's an interesting thing about that, because like it's it's it sounds like from your the references you're drawing from for this movie and this movie, it, it, forgive me for putting words in your mouth, feels like a film that's sort of closer to your kind of influences than the movies like Beauty and the Beast and all that stuff. And that's because you're growing up in an age where, like, you know, there's there's you know, the films that you're referencing right. aren't Snow White. They're a few years, decades right. later. They're, they're 2000 Leagues Under the Sea, which also isn't considered part of this kind of, you know, corpus of Disney movies. So it's it, the way we talk about these things. I guess it's a, a partly, you know, things like the theme parks and, and all this sort of stuff. What characters are on display on the parades? What characters are sold in the shops and all this sort of stuff? But there's this, you know, there's the, uh, you know, there's this subculture of all these great Disney characters and films that people know about, but they don't, they don't have the same access to. And I suspect the people who have watched Atlantis now, what they say, they're 20, 30 years old. That makes sense. They're now, they're, I'm sure a lot of them are animators and are thinking about this movie as a reference point. So it feeds back into the history yeah, there are, there, in much more. Um, yeah. Things. I mean, that, that's like one of um, somebody, somebody had sent me a link to a, uh, like a YouTube video and it was one of the best things that I saw. Um, and it was this girl, woman, who said she got into archaeology because of because of this movie. <laughs> and you know, and she she went chapter and verse. Why? You know what what this what this meant to her and why she you know. And I thought that's that's just amazing. Not on purpose, you know. That's that was not <laughs> our reasoning for doing this movie. Sure. Sure, yeah. sure, sure, sure. Absolutely amazing. amazing. One of the one of the things that so so when I teach um, Disney and Disney Renaissance students love talking about the villains and they like talking about particularly the Renaissance era villains. Um, and one of the things that struck me about your 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 kind of three film Beauty and the Beast, Hunchback, and, and this film is the kind of humanity of the of the villain, where the villain is often the space for this sort of. Um, quick change, transformation, uh, evil manifest. You know, I'm thinking of, of, of Ursula, or I'm thinking of, uh, I guess, Jafar when he turns into a big snake at the end. Um, but all of the villains of your, let's, I mean, uh, there's a, Frollo is very close to, to to Rourke. There's something kind of grounded about the villains, and I think when I watched it this time, it feels it the, the film feels like it's grounded, it, although it's it's fantasy and it of course in lots and lots of ways. The characters themselves mm. are very grounded and very earthy, quite literally in the case of, of some of them, very earthy. <laughs> um, but I just kind of James Garner's character, aside from the fact that he just looks like my grandpa, which is has always just freaked me and my mum out. My goodness! So I sent her a picture. I sent her a picture of the character today because I said I'm watching this film and look at the character who looks a little bit like James Garner. But there was something around like he he's he's kind of a twist villain insofar as he's his villainy comes from his motives rather than his. Um, metamorphic body, or and, and so I, I just wondered if you could kind of speak a little bit about the the ensemble nature of this film because the characters are feel very very different and very I don't want to use the word realistic but there's something around their motives or the fact that right. they um, switch allegiance that I found really compelling when I watched it actually um, and even uh, and even uh, Helga so this kind of German second in command which feeds into this this military aesthetic the fact that she even gets a redemption at the end I just found yeah I just found the ensemble nature of all these different characters really believable authentic so I just I just kind of wondered in terms of the inspiration of, of that range of characters um, that I feel kind of quite quite realistic i know it sounds stupid to go your characters feel really realistic but they're just something that the, i think the villain the villainy of of rourke did feel different to the sort of disney villains of, of before so i just wondered if you had any kind of thoughts on on the, the the genesis of that that ensemble and maybe what what was going into your your thought as you and kirk were thinking about these characters well we we didn't really we didn't want to be obvious about who who the villains were and you know, in a sense, they all kind of were a little bit. They're all mercenary. They're all in it for the money. 
um, but most of them have good hearts, at, you know, at, at their core, and can you know, and can see, okay, this is wrong. They can turn. They can learn. Um, Rourke is somebody that we wanted, you know, that we wanted him to have some good points. You know, when, when he said, if you took out everything out of a all the stolen articles out of a museum, you'd have an empty building. That's true, you know, and it's like, <laughs> that's, that's, he's, he's not wrong. Um, but, yeah, and, and as much as we wanted it to be something like, um, you know, like, yeah, we don't, we don't know, that, we don't know who the villain is. As soon as people see Rourke, you know, standing there by the submarine and everyone's boarding, people go, oh, he's the one, he's the guy, you know. <laughs> um, but, but still, you know, we, James Garner. I mean, he's he's been as a, as an actor and the roles he's played is he's like so beloved. Yeah. We thought this is this is going to help us a little bit, you know, because he's such he can be a curmudgeon um, and and he can be a hard ass, but he doesn't necessarily read as a villain right away. No, no, no. And but at his core, yeah, we we knew we wanted Rourke to be like very very single minded, very driven, you know, for to to his goal. But, and that ambiguity is, is picked up in the character design. I think that's yeah. When, when, the, the sort of my, stu- my students have written a lot about the the kind of queerness, the formal queerness, or, or, or of Disney villains, and the sort of in, in betweenness of somebody like Ursula that is that is caught seemingly between between humanity and non humanity. Whereas whereas Rourke is 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 a is a commander, and and there isn't there aren't those clues that you that you suggested. There aren't those clues within the character design. And in fact, a lot of the characters um, are very well. All of the characters are very distinctive, but they all kind of have a potential to be villainous, which justifies or, or qualifies the fact that they turn. But also, there's enough in them right. that when they turn back, you believe that as well. And so I really I kind of really liked that that it was the the, the character. The, 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 the characterizations or the personalities were, were very um, were, were, were fed into the design and I liked that about Rourke that he he was always on like he was on the edge and that ambiguity of his character is is manifest in the in, in his design he is imposing but there's there's even the potential yeah. for, for... Uh, all those characters all the kind of mercenaries are incredibly uh, you know, well realized and the kind of you know stars of the show in many ways. The kind of yeah. you know, I don't know what you would call them, the dirty dozen or the or the whatever they are. They're kind of wh- wh- tell us how they all came into being because they're all unique. They're all there's they're, there's a lot of multicultural things going on. There's lots of different nationalities. Um, yeah. yeah, I'd love to hear about how these characters uh, came into came into. Well, that, that is, I mean, you said the dirty dozen and Magnificent Seven, and you know these ensembles that we that you know we we watched those movies and like okay, there's this kind of guy and there's this kind of guy. And, and so we wanted, we wanted that kind of flavor, but we also, um, you know, from very early on, we said, Preston Whitmore, he's going to get the best of the best and he doesn't care who or what they are. Um, you know, sex, race, age, any of that. So, you know, he's got an old chuck wagon cook from, from the 1860s and, and, you know, and he's got a little, um, you know, the daughter of his former mechanic, who is you know, this savant grease monkey um, and, and everybody in between. And, you know, so we, we wrote dossiers on all of these characters, and their backgrounds and their, their talents and their, their skills. And that was part of the fun, you know, just like, yeah. So Mrs. Whitmore, um, you know, she started out as a dance hall girl, you know, the, a, a Floridora girl. Um you know, back in the, back in the, uh, like the 1860s, but she kind of met up with and, and, you know, with, with like the, the, the burgeoning, uh, telecommunications giants at the time and just like clicked with that. And that's, that's where she got her expertise and, and her, uh, um, you know, her skills. Um, Helga was a military brat. You know, she, she went from base to base with her, with her father, who was a, who was an officer and, you know, and, she was brought up in a military background. So all of these, all these different characters, we, we gave them their backgrounds. And um, like I said, and, and Preston Whitmore, he recognized the best of the best. You know, this guy, he was a, he was a bomb maker for, for, uh, you know, the Sicilian mafia. This, this guy was a, you know, is a, a tunnel digger. This is, a, you know, and, and Milo is uh, he, the son of, of one of his old colleagues who, has this talent for linguistics and, and uh, map making. 
so yeah, that's that's where we wanted. You know, we like I said, taking um, taking the template from like, the Greedy Dozen or, or uh, uh, the Seven Samurai or you know any of those. Like, okay, here's the tough guy. Here's the here's the sensitive one. Here's the here's the funny one. You know, and, and kind of mixing it all together and throwing in a little Disney cartoon. And, yeah. So you you wrote dossiers on all these characters. You in, you invented a new language for for Atlantis, or you you commissioned people to to write the language mm. for you. So there's a lot of work. There's a, I'm assuming you put the same amount of investment into the the world of Atlantis and what it looked like and its architecture and all that sort of stuff. Is this that's part of your normal process of making these things? Did you do the same thing on on previous movies and you thought you'd apply the same skill and just research breeds? Um, understanding and familiarity or was that something you felt you needed to do with these particular yeah, we we uh, probably did it more on atlantis because uh, as i mentioned before we didn't have um we didn't have a book yeah. to fall back on you know we didn't we didn't have right. the hugo to tell us okay this this guy is this way um so so we had to we had to kind of wing it yeah and these are I, and and also like you know if you, you know be- bell be- uh, beast like these are archetypal fairy tale characters it seems it, you know it doesn't have to seem this way but it just seems instinctively a little bit odd to sort of write a dossier on who, who is the beast you know we know who the beast is he's a character from folklore <laughs> right. right but you need to do that with this that must have been very creatively um exciting because you're 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 creating all these rules from scratch rather than kind of riffing or or improvising over right the i mean there was there was some you know and then you need to be we've got the talking clock and the candle and the teapot you know yeah, all, course, all those yeah, guys yeah, yeah. um but but um yeah it, there was more of it and like yeah it, it was it was fun you know to 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 dive into this and the animators came into it as well you know they're just like what if you have this kind of character and I, you know, as, as always happens, there were characters that didn't make it to the screen. You know, we had, we, we had like at, at that time in history, there was, um, there was this kind of spiritualist psychic movement that was very big. And so we had, um, you know, this, this, this kind of spiritualist, uh, a, a medium that went with them who turned out to be a huge fraud and it just, you know, it, eh, too many characters. Um, Preston Whitmore had like a, stupid you know kind of nephew that that went on and we were just gumming up the works and he went over the side as well but yeah i mean there was there was a whole lot of different uh different different characters that we thought of and the animators and the and the voice talent had a lot of role in shaping them as well you know dr sweet the the voice that, that phil morris brought to that um it really helped really helped define that character you know we we kind of knew who he who he was and who he wanted to be but when phil started voicing him it was like okay we've got to write some new lines for this guy same with uh with don novello and Vinny. you know with all of them there was once once the voice actors kind of inhabited that role and gave it a life it was like okay we we, we need to we need to build on this because because there's they're coming up with stuff that we didn't think of. Now we gotta. Now we gotta take the next step. I think yeah. The, the, there's a lot been 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 written and said, and we've spoken about this in previous episodes about these debates around kind of star voices. But it seems like, of course, you have Michael J. Fox and, and James Garner and and um, uh, Leonard Nimoy and, and Jim Varney and you've worked many times with David Ogden Stars. But there's a lot of kind of character actors and 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 also the, these sorts of debates around at what point does the voice actor or again, that creative bargain that the animators or the, the directors have with the voice artists who are who are saying the lines but speaking them in a way that means that you have to change the direction of the character, and then there's a bit more there's a bit more give and take with the animator and the or, or certainly a bit more give and take between the animator and the voice actor. And and in some institutions, you do the voice and animate to the voice in 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 anime, or you do the animation first and then you try and match up the voice. But it seems like the voice recording is happening at the same time as the film is being produced. So you're, you're in a position to, to write, as you said, new lines and, and, and tweak the story in ways that are um, kind of serving the voice actors. Is that right? They're, they're, they're working at the same time as the film is being produced over this extended period. Yeah. And it, 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 it varies, you know, from production to production and, you know, right, right. directing team to directing team. Um, Kirk and I learned really early on to, to let the actors, you know, to, to don't, to don't 
nail them down to, you know, you have to do exactly the script. Um, because a lot of times they can be, they can be better than, you know, than, than what you come up with. Um, the funny, my opinion, the funniest line in Beauty and the Beast was David Sires. I mean, he came up with that like on the recording day when he's um, looking down, when the Beast is looking down at uh, at Belle in, in the snow and she's pulling the horse along and, and the Beast says, I want to do something, but what? And Cogsworth says, oh, it's the usual things, flowers, chocolates, promises you don't intend to keep. <laughs> and he, he said, he did that like on the spot. You know, and we, we learned early on to let David just, you know, come up with stuff. You know, if you've got anything, any different, and we say this to all the actors, if you've got a different way of saying it, it's more comfortable to you, or you've got another idea for it, please, you know, just, we, we would encourage him to read it as written at least once, but then, but then, you know, to, to go with it, you know, because if, if their ideas were, you know, didn't, didn't work as well, we, we always had a fallback, but, um, and and some like Don Novello, we were lucky if we read it as written once because he would just like go off on these tangents <laughs> that were hilarious. Jim Varney as well. It's like, oh my god, we had so much so much material. We said we could do just from the outtakes the Cookie movie. You know, it was it, it was <laughs> so funny, um, and and that was something we we really enjoyed and we really benefited from because you know these guys are good. They. A lot of them yeah. come from, you know, improv or, or uh, you know, or writers themselves. And so, yeah, I mean, we were, we were happy to, to, to let them do that. I know not all um, productions do that. You know, they, they've got yeah. their script yeah. and they've got their story and they need these lines like this. And, mm. you know, sometimes we were like that. Sometimes we, this, this scene has got to work this certain way, you know, so could you please read it this way? And we never had a problem you know we never had a problem with with actors i have been particularly blessed with with actors that i've worked with having heard stories from other productions like oh so and so is a nightmare it's, oh you can't get anything from him or, or he's he's always angry or you know, whatever you know but but we have always had like the best experience with with all of our actors right and uh did you did you uh, uh leonard nimoy was that <laughs> uh, a conscious you got to get in because of Star Trek. Uh, we're, we're going sci-fi here. Or was he just the best person for the best role? Or uh, it's both. Yeah, it was it was both. I mean, you know, because yeah. we we knew he had a great voice, and and this would this it would have it was the voice that we knew would work for the character. But it was also like, oh my god, let's get him. You know, if we could get him, yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it it was he he because he's also you know he's a director and a, and a writer himself so he he knew you know he knew right what to do he was like he was like the ultimate professional you know and came in and boom he he was like just right on top of it so he he was really good to work with if not you know not the friendliest most chatty like some of the actors you could like hang around with for an hour after the session and just like you know bullshit the afternoon away Leonard was not that guy, but he was always like, man, he like yeah. one take and, yeah. and, you, and you're good. We've also got an interesting subgenre of, of, of it seems to me, uh, colleagues listening, you need to write an academic paper on the influence of the Frasier cast on this period of Disney history. So I noticed <laughs> John, John, John Mahoney um, appears, obviously. And uh, we just uh, we just did a previous thing about David Hyde Pierce and things like yeah. that. So, yeah, he must have been. Um, must have yeah. Been. Um, John Mahoney was, he was not our first choice for that role. We had actually cast Lloyd Bridges in that role. And, and um, Lloyd was, he was actually, it was like in his final months. And he was, right. you know, when we brought him in and he, he did a couple sessions for us. And afterwards, one of the sound engineers said, he's really, he's, he's really, um, he's losing energy you know he's 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 running out of gas because he had seen him like just a few months before and he said he, he could see the difference and within a couple months you know Lloyd had passed so we said okay um you know we want this kind of this certain kind of energy and a certain age and so John Mahoney I'm um I'm, I'm conscious of time and I guess I wanted to ask 
the thing that we often ask um, uh, animators and, and directors and visual effects artists, um, is there a particular uh, scene or sequence or character or moment from, from Atlantis that you are kind of most proud of? It doesn't have to be, I guess, the most spectacular or something that was that took, you know, six months or something. Just sort of interesting because I think there are so many little bits to the film that we haven't managed to cover but I just wondered if there was a, a, a moment or a, or a, yeah, a sequence or a, a particular line or something that, that kind of sticks in your mind from the production When you of the, watch the it film. now you think oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. For me and, and this is something I, somebody else might have asked this or maybe I just like kind of figured it out myself but for me the, um, the sequence that I like the most is when they go down into the crystal chamber and you know you see those, okay. those the king stones around the the floating crystal and the, the whole interchange between the characters and um you know rourke is dead set on getting that thing and Helga is nervous and milo is like i don't know i don't it's, mm. it just says it's alive you know and just so this just this weird new thing you know it's floating 50 feet up in the air and she goes walking out on the water and the music it was you know some of the best in the movie so yeah for me that's that's my favorite we haven't had a chance to talk about milo but i think that 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 point yeah. is exactly right the kind of he's learning as he goes he's he's skilled in lots and lots of ways but you know you, you've the film replaces the fairy tale book that big opens so many disney films with his own the kind of the book that he's following and trying to make sense of this world and i liked the fact there were so many instances where he says i don't I, I don't know, or I didn't catch it, or I didn't... That sort of element to his character that plays out physically in terms of his... Mm. his and the fact that you have that, that re false reveal at the beginning where you think he's given this big lecture. Um, <coughs> and speaking from experience, having to, to lecture in front of not many people sometimes right. <laughs> at university, sort of that reveal that, oh, OK, so he's, he's an interesting protagonist, I think, in lots and lots of ways. Um, yeah, but, um, yeah. Future episodes, we'll have to return to Milo. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. F final question for me before we let you go would be: um, we, we've, you've mentioned at the start that the studio sort of was was pretty supportive, but obviously it's always going to have a bit of pushback and always going to things like that. So if you're prepared to share any, and if you're not, that's absolutely fine. But I would like to: if, is there like a note? I'd like the note that like is the most ridiculous. Like, oh, <laughs> you know, you know, can you can you have a can we have some songs or can we make it a princess or something like that? If that you'd be prepared to share, and the note that actually was quite useful, and you thought, oh, actually we can do that, and there's something, that, and that's helped, and it and it made its way into the movie. And so, well, er early on, and this was this was kind of our fault. Um, was we had a lot more of the journey going down, you know, the the the, the traveling right. going in, and there were a lot more like strange creatures on the way uh, that they met to the point where Mike Bignola was calling it the monster parade, and yeah. We did a we did an early um, uh, test screening of you know the, the the story reel of this, and the studio just shut us down. <laughs> All right, everybody leave except the directors leave the room, and because we you know the whole right. crew was there, and we were going to sit around at lunch, and mm. everybody was kicked out. It was just us, and we just you know had the riot act read to us like you're not doing this. Um, so, I mean, it was. It, it wasn't a ridiculous note. I mean, it was depressing at the time, you know, because we were getting dressed <laughs> down. But how long? How long would that sequence have been if it had been? Left oh my god! Or... I mean, it would. It would have. It would have been. We we would have had a two-hour <laughs> movie. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, and the 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 core reasoning was correct. It's like we want to get to Atlantis. That's the name of the movie. We want to get there, and we're spending all this time getting there. And we were still, you know, kind of in the journey to the center of the earth mode. Yeah. Then it's like we this journey part we, to, to us was interesting, but you know, we're gently reminded that um, a we, we, that's that's not the title of the movie. B you don't have time, you know, to to make this. And the other thing was, as I'm sure you're aware, we had to redo the, the whole beginning of the uh, of the movie because there was the um, what we called the Viking prologue. Um, oh yeah, and that was something. I mean, we were we were fully committed to the point where I'm sure you've seen it's fully animated and in color and you know effects mm -hmm. and everything. And that was when um, our our story head uh, John Sanford he said we're 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 uh, th this. This isn't working, you know. We we're 
we're we're not we're not connecting with the characters when we get to Atlantis because we don't know anything about them. You know, we didn't we we haven't seen anything. So um, mm. we uh, you know we reluctantly admitted that John was right, and this was an expensive mistake that we made. But uh, mm. you know, when we talked it over, we said, okay, all right, yeah, let's 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 try something else. So, you know, how, how are we going to do this? And we came upon the idea of showing the last day of Atlantis. And, uh, mm. but, but that, that then allows like that, that ends, it's an interesting, it's interesting in that sense, because it begins the film from a particular kind of perspective that the film then doesn't revisit for some time, which is really interesting. You have the perspective from the Atlanteans, as you said, on the last day, and then, and then you have the title, and then it shifts to sort of Milo's, journey yeah. and you're sort of waiting it works really well dramatically i think to what you're waiting for this moment of kind of um yeah it does it, it, it builds an anticipation which wasn't there yeah. at all before you know it's like well maybe they'll get there we don't know what's going to happen but but now you've seen <laughs> what used to be and yeah. like okay so what's going to be there so yeah i mean and yeah. which you know i wish we <laughs> wish we'd saved some time and money and thought of that first but we didn't <laughs> you know we, we we went through the mistake phase and uh yeah such is the bad, creative process bad. well uh gary it's been yeah. absolutely pleasure talking to you and and, and learning more about uh, atlantis the empire it's it's a it's a it's a great movie if anyone out there hasn't seen it what are you doing but get on them um, get get uh, you, you know doing? get on and, and and watch it because it's a really it's a really imp- uh well, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a great example and as i as i say and i say it again like you know, th- th- there's a, there's a there's a cream suppose of the top of these Disney movies, but actually, I, I don't think it works like that, and I don't think audiences appreciate it like that. I think you know, the, it's the classic opening box office numbers problem, right? Those are the things that speak. Right, but right. actually, I think Treasure I think Planet had the same had the same issue. You know, that oh, yeah. that didn't didn't do great in on its opening, but today it's got a very loyal following. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll have to. So listeners, start a petition. We want to see. Uh, we want to see a Milo doll in the Disney shops. Um, um, <laughs> justice for justice yeah, for Atlantis. Absolutely. I think I have yeah, one somewhere. Oh really? <laughs> oh, no, here we go. I don't. Oh, here we go. Uh, Wait, yes, I do. Oh. Wait, one moment. Right. Okay. It's, it's happening. happening. Listeners, you're not getting any of this, this because. Is... Uh, um, no, no. So we have to describe what we're seeing. Hey, there he is. Okay. There he is. So is that part of the is that part of the gig? You've got to approve all the merchandising as well. We're looking at a doll of um of Milo here. It's yeah, he's he's like a twelve inch um action figure. Um, ah. <laughs> it's yeah. important not to call him a doll. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Tina, you can call her a doll, but she's pretty much an action figure as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, early on there was there was um there was, there was a lot of optimism. You know, they were they were going to uh, they were going to build a holy ride at Disney World in Florida. They were going to right. completely revamp the submarine ride in Disneyland in Anaheim. Um, right. You know, they Replace had replaced it with yours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, there, you know, there were plans for sequels and all that, and then the box office was disappointing, and all of that stuff kind of went. But um, because you know the nature of these films they want the the merchandise out uh, you know when the film comes out you know they don't they don't wait to see what the box office is like and then start making sure. merchandise they want to they want to strike while the iron's hot so they had milo and others already in production and already made and you know on the shelves for for when the film opened hmm. um they just didn't make any more a little insight into the merchandising. Um, yeah, as Alex said, thank you, thank you, Gary, for for um, yeah, giving up an hour and a bit of your time to talk about Atlantis, and hopefully, yeah, um, listeners of of well, they should go and watch the film, of course. But um, yeah, learned a little bit about how it kind of works within the Disney studio, and, and as you said, this sort of Disney mill. So um, yeah, <laughs> the mouse factory. Yeah. So, as always, listeners can follow us uh, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Fananim Research, F A N A N I M Research. Um, and you can find us at fancy animation.org. You'll find the uh, podcast archive and blog archive there. We've got to have loads of stuff on this era, Chris, in terms of Disney, um, the Renaissance, but also this, e- this interesting era, kind of what is this post Renaissance? Um, loads of stuff for listeners to check out, including a, a, another back catalogue episode featuring John Musker and Ron Clements talking about Treasure Planet. So it's a good sort of pairing episode for this one. 
Yeah, yeah. If you're Disney fans, um, go back through some of the archive. We've got blog posts on on kind of Disney animation more broadly. But I think, yeah, hopefully it's becoming clear this this post Renaissance era, the the 90s and 2000s, is is a really yeah intriguing, interesting, creative, experimental in many ways um, era. Uh, and it's been really nice to revisit a lot of these films. On the one hand, just to see them again, but also revisit them with the people that made them. If, <laughs> if you great. didn't uh, catch a little bit of it or you want something uh, clarified or explained or, or a topic to go over, you can, of course, send your suggestions at fananimresearch. That's F-A-N-A-N-I-M research at gmail.com for a future footnote episode, and we'd be delighted to cover it. But otherwise, that's been us for an episode, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.